Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for this opportunity to make this presentation. So I'll be um, speaking today afternoon on a systematic review that we conducted, uh, the topic being infectious disease modeling for SARS-CoV-2 in Africa to guide policy. So this is a uh, part of the work that I'm doing for my PhD and we conducted this systematic review in order for me to be able to look at the gaps that were there in literature and to formulate my objectives for my PhD. So um, I skipped the bit about the background of SARS-CoV-2. We know there are about um, more than 600 million cases that have been reported globally with quite a number of vaccines that have been administered and mortalities that have been recorded. So I decided because that is more of common knowledge now, just to go um, dive into the discussion being mathematical models and how they have been used and their usefulness in modeling. So with regards to COVID-19, um, the usefulness of mathematic mod models was to capture the dynamic behavior of a system, uh, which really um, populations are dynamic in nature and mathematical models are useful to be able to capture this behavior and to predict the number of cases and deaths that is the peak of um, an epidemic and also to be able to, to um, define what the worst case scenario would look like and also to be able to inform on resource allocation in the, in the event of a pandemic or an epidemic and also to be able to look at how to optimize the known constraints such as hospitalization, which was a big deal for COVID-19 pandemic and also vaccines, given limited vaccines in the initial phases of the pandemic as well as estimate the impact of interventions that have been put into place. So to the right of my screen is a, a graph showing what it is, what, how mathematical models were used to inform on what needs to be done to flatten the curve. And the critical things that were more important during the pandemic were for the health system not to be overwhelmed. So with models, we were able to, to look at what interventions would, would need to be put in place for the curve to be flattened. So that is the image that I have to the right of the screen. So um, mathematical models, as I said, they, their utility is critical, but it is really important um, um, and for utility and accuracy in decision-making and appropriate response to public health interventions uh, during um, emergencies, but this is really a factor of their calibration to local data, the speed of obtaining and communicating their results, ease of understanding and willingness by policymakers to use their insights. So models are really useful when policymakers and mathematical modelers, as well as other scientists come in and uh, derive questions that can be addressed by models. So we have an image of a word cloud, which was um, was really describing the, the issues that were around COVID-19, issues to do with estimating the, the mortality, estimating cases, planning for limited resources, forecasting, uh, and insights that were derived as well as vaccination. So this is a word cloud that shows the issues around the pandemic or during the pandemic that models used were used to address. So the motivation of our study was that there has been a significant underrepresentation of SARS-CoV-2 epidemiological models in Africa compared to other continents. And epidemiological models for Africa have not been parameterized using uh, local estimates, but have borrowed heavily on estimates from other continents, thus bringing the issue of possible lack of capacity on modeling and how to interpret, mo how to interpret model outputs. And the models that were developed in Africa were not timely in addressing emerging issues such as different emerging variants during the course of the pandemic. So our objectives for our review were one, what was to determine the spatial and temporal patterns of SARS-CoV-2 models in Africa. The second objective was to describe the use of local, local data to calibrate the models and local expertise in the modeling activities. And the third objective was to determine the key modeling questions and policy insights for SARS-CoV-2 models for Africa. So we conducted a systematic review of literature based on the PRISMA guidelines. We looked at uh, 
various databases such as PubMed, Embase, Web of Science, and Med Archives for SARS-CoV-2, models that had been uh, published for one or more African countries. So the preprints, we looked at those, those papers that had been posted by April of 2021, as well as the published literature. So we retrieved uh, literature that had been published by April 2021. So our inclusion criteria um, included two such terms, the population, which is representative of the P in the PECO, the population being all African, all 54 African countries that are member states to the UN. And our exposure of interest was, more, was dynamic mathematical models and SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. And we focused in models, we focused primarily on models that looked at modeling transmission dynamics of COVID-19. So those were the two such terms that we included in our literature review. We excluded papers that looked at statistical modeling methods and methods that did not primarily focus on COVID-19, models that did not primarily focus on COVID-19, but looked at the implication of COVID-19 with regard to other diseases such as malaria or TB. So those were excluded. And we also excluded studies that were not written in English. So our data variables that we extracted, we had a list of variables to address our objectives. The first variable was authorship. We looked at first and last authorship. That is in, in, um, in view of the affiliation to the institution that they were in, the geographical location of the institution. We also looked at the study population or the country of study, the month and the year when the study was received or published. The type of model, we, we sought to look at whether it was a deterministic or a stochastic model. The model structure, looking at the different uh, compartments that, that were used to build the models and the number of state variables. We also looked at uh, use of local epidemiological data to calibrate the models. And we looked at the parameters that were most sensitive um, from the papers that were included in the study. And the key modeling questions that were addressed and the use of models, whether they were used for insight, assessment, estimation, prediction, or planning, and the policy insights that were derived from the modeling work. So our results, we had a total of 762 papers. Of this, 17% were from PubMed. A majority of the papers, um, which was 62%, were preprints from Med archives. So the distribution of the papers is as um, bullet one, where we had 60, 62 being from Med Archives, 17 from PubMed, uh, 15 from Embase, and 6% were from Web of Science. So 100 papers met the inclusion criteria for full text review. 74 of the 100 papers were included in the review, 50 of which were published papers, and 24 were preprints. Were preprints. So 22 of the 54 countries that were included in the review had, did not have any published paper or preprint paper on SARS-CoV-2 modeling. And nearly two thirds of the papers were from 8% of the African countries. These were South Africa, which had 15 of the papers included. Nigeria had 11 modeling papers that were included and Morocco had eight papers included in the review. So um, this is just a PRISMA diagram showing the process of inclusion from screening of the full text to where we ended up having uh, 74 papers that were included, 50 of which were, were published and 24 were preprint papers. So this um, map shows the spatial distribution of papers that were included in the review. We can see that there's um, vast geographical uh, variation in, in distribution of model modeled papers. We appreciate that majority were coming from South Africa and Morocco up here in the north. And for Kenya, um, we only had six papers that had been included uh, that had been that had been included in the review. So this is just to show that there's very limited capacity for modeling or actual uh, published literature that had been included that had been presented uh, to address issues to do with the pandemic within the African continent. 
So this one is to look at uh, the temporal distribution of papers where we saw that most papers were published or posted in July of 2020. That was after the, first, the, peak, of, after the peak of the first wave and a total of 16 papers were published, uh, posted between October and December, just after the second peak. And looking at the turnaround time, we appreciated that 39% of the papers were published in less than three months from when the first case was reported in Africa. And 40% of the papers were published within three to six months and 8% of the papers published uh, after with, within a time of more than six months. So this just shows the, distrib the temporal distribution of publication. And we appreciated that a good number of papers were rapidly published to be able to, to give some insight on what was happening within the continent. So um, onto the model structure, 76%, which is majority of our models were deterministic in nature, uh, given that uh, leading to the fact that we didn't have a number, a good number represented stochastic models or stochasticity or randomness within the population. So most of the models were deterministic. 72% um, and 65% had a first and last author affiliated to an African institution uh, respectively. And only 12% of our models were calibrated to using local data, such as demographic data and Google mobility data. With regards to model fitting, 93% of the papers were fitted to data on confirmed cases. This is cases that were listed on the line lists. And the transmission parameter, which is often referred to as beta, was found to drive the most sensitivity within the model outputs. So looking at the key modeling questions and policy, uh, key modeling questions or use of models, we we grouped this into different categories where we looked at um, assessment and planning, models that were used for forecasting and prediction, and models that were used for estimation of key model outputs. So for those that addressed issues to do with assessment and planning, the key things that came out was assessment of the effectiveness of the non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as lockdown, social distancing, curfews, the benefits of scaling up of mass testing. Also a paper that looked at cost effectiveness of control interventions, uh, vaccine efficacy and the impact of vaccination or need for booster vaccine. So those looked at um, mitigation measures that were put in place and they were used to plan forward with regards to the model outputs. So for, for forecasting and prediction, the, there was a paper that looked at the increase, what would what number of beds would be needed, would be required to be able to cater for an increase in cases. So the increase of number of hospital beds for severe and critical cases, that was a paper by Zin. And uh, estimation of key parameter or key model outputs. These outputs that we were able to get were number of deaths, number of reported cases that would lead to widespread community transmission. So the policy insights that were derived from the modeling work was done. Uh, there was a phased out lifting of lockdowns, which was shown to be effective with regards to reducing the number of cases and flattening the, the curve. Um, a combination of both prevention and treatment strategies was also found to be cost effective through the modeling work that was done and improved case management to reduce duration of infectiousness and enforce home quarantine or isolation of cases. Improvement of community awareness through risk communication and community engagement and higher vaccine efficacy required lower vaccination coverage to achieve adequate herd immunity from the models that looked at vaccination as a strategy. So a bit on the discussion, we appreciated that there was a geographical variation uh, looking at the 54 uh, African countries. This showed that there's limited modeling capacity compared to countries in the developed world where modeling evidence has been used to underpin government's advice. None of the models reviewed were used to quantify the allocation of resources, such as oxygen, which was seen to be a, a big cost driver and, and PPEs, which are the personal protective equipments. So we did not um, find any models that looked to quantify how this how the quantification of such resources, which were very crucial 
in the earlier phases of the pandemic. Also, the studies did not incorporate emerging variants of concern and their impact on the pandemic control. So they were not able to capture the dynamic, the dynamism within the, the pandemic in a rapid manner to be able to give timely advice. And none of the models incorporated economic effects of the control interventions such as lockdowns or curfews. Only one model looked at cost effectiveness of vaccination, but they did not look at how lockdowns and curfews would impact on the economy. So our recommendations, therefore, based on what we found, only 12 papers, 12% 12 of the papers use local data. Therefore, we recommend that there's need to strengthen local data structures, which are useful for model cal calibration to be able to generate contextualized and meaningful projections for policy insights. There's also need to increase modeling capacity in Africa and to cultivate multidisciplinary modeling efforts through forming of consortiums, which are critical in building models rapidly during public health emergencies. Thank you.